afternoon. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Very much welcome. I'm very glad that everybody's here on time. Um, and you already got uh, settled with your sandwiches. Uh, thanks a lot for that, for coming and in time. Um, on time. Um, I would like to introduce on, uh, on behalf of the Independent Evaluation Unit and the uh, head of the youth, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Puri, uh, this lunch talk, which is the 23rd lunch talk of the IU, which means that we're almost two years into it, as these are monthly talks. Um, you know, this, uh, for those who are new, these are monthly um, opportunities to talk about topics which are important for the GCF. Normally, they, we try to focus on aspects, or we try to touch on aspects that have to do with evaluation or climate or uh, development or the, preferably the three of them together. And we have uh, had several uh, international leaders talking about different topics. And of course, we are here also to increase the understanding of the, of the GCF on the evaluation and on the IU. Um, this talk is also recorded, so I assume that the, the blue jeans is on and working. No, it's not. Okay, I assume wrong. Um, uh, so those who really want to attend these uh, talks have to come here. That's the kind of message that uh, that we get today about that. So as we don't nor no, do normally, these talks normally these talks last 25 minutes um, in, of presentation, and then we will have about half an hour for uh, questions and answers. We also have, and correct me now, I don't want to say something wrong before I say it, we have a, uh, okay, the opportunity to tweet, of course, everybody can do it. We have a tweet uh, handle for the IU. Um, so one thing I, I, I would like to say is that, um, of course, it's uh, clear to everyone this is Forest Week, and until a few minutes ago we were wondering with uh, Stephen whether the so-called, um, so-defined forest people of GCF are here, and I see them here, right? If you raise your hands, who are the so-called, uh, forest people. Okay, they're all there in the central part of the room, and they, ex they escaped convention just in time to be here. So we are very happy about that. So let me start by introducing uh, uh, Stephen, which is, um, uh, who is a, he's a um, uh, director of, of Forest Trends, Ecosystem Management Marketplace and Supply Change Initiatives. And there he's responsible for overall strategy development and stakeholder coordination. He is also principal and founder of Greenpoint Innovations, and, which is a company that integrates pioneering technologies, arts, and in-depth subject matter expertise to contribute to a more sustainable future. Now, the talk today was announced and is described in the, in the flyer as approaching the ecosystem marketplace. And just before coming here, we had a chat with uh, Stephen, and I asked him to explain what that meant, and he told me he was not sure about what that meant. Uh, but uh, it's part of the topic, basically. But the, 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 the real content of this, if we can rephrase it, is how can the private sector help stop or reduce or manage deforestation? So that's basically, the, in essence, the topic which has been summarized in a different way in the, in the title. So um, I think it's time to uh, give the floor to, to Stephen, and I also wish you a good lunch. And since we are talking about forest and deforestation and helping about that, be uh, mindful to um, recycle what uh, the, con the wrapping of what you are using, what you are using, what you are consuming right now. So thank you very much. I will give you totally the floor. Stephen, please. <clears throat> thank you, Roberto. Um, it's very nice to be here with you all today. My name is Steven D'Onofrio, and uh, just as the quick introduction said, I'm director at Forest Trends, but the two initiatives that I work primarily with are uh, the, for the supply change and ecosystem marketplace initiatives. Um, before we really get into it, let me just give you a quick sense of who I am and my background. Uh, I've sort of spent my career in a few different categories, I would say there's, there's three of them. One is around carbon finance and cap and trade. Uh, so I was an economist at the Chicago Climate Exchange and then, uh, and then migrated into more of the corporate sustainability sphere, sphere over at uh, CDP, which is formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. And then for the last five years, I've been working with Forest Trends. Um, and what I'll be talking about today is our supply chain initiative. And what, what it really is is a, a platform that aggregates information about corporate actions and policies to address commodity-driven deforestation. Uh, so it's sort of a melting of, of some of the, the worlds that I've been in before because uh, just like yesterday, uh, I was on a panel with Juan, we were talking about um, sort of the role of Red Plus and, and the opportunities for carbon finance 
uh, as a mechanism or finance into Red Plus, which is reduced emissions from deforestation degradation in landscapes to help stop deforestation and, and, produce, and encourage sustainable agriculture. Um, so, so what I'll get into just now and, and start to you know, really develop for you is a picture about Forest Trends being a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. It's a relatively small organization uh, comparatively to some of the very large nonprofits. Uh, so we have, um, we have most of our team based in D.C. I'm in New York, and then we have other people that work uh, geographically in different areas, Latin America, Asia, Africa. Um, the, the tagline <clears throat> that you see there is, I think, overarching, but a lot of the work streams, whether it's dealing with communities initiatives or uh, working on water, working in uh, tracking markets and finance flows, it all kind of works into the ecosystem of, of forests and, and biodiversity. So these are the different initiatives that, that we cover. I won't get into you know, too much of the weeds on that, but um, what I wanted to focus on was, was sort of this real emerging understanding that natural climate solutions are a pathway to achieving uh, our Paris Agreement goals. The, the fact is though that forests are, are still not really a part of the climate solution conversation. Uh, and, and as Nature for Climate, which is a, a coalition group came out with uh, last year, um, there needs to be a much you know, stronger investment to realize this 30% solution that the Paris Agreement, that, that forests can play and, and lands can play in achieving Paris Agreement goals. So that's significant. And the, why, it's also significant because it's a very cost-effective, readily available, now-term uh, opportunity before us. We don't need to develop crazy technology significant investments with long ROIs in order to achieve these reductions that are available today. What we need to do is, is coordinate and make the right investments into those landscapes. So at the same time, without doing anything about it, forests and lands present a problem because there's significant deforestation occurring at the hands of, of corporate supply chains, agricultural production, uh, and various other reasons. But what we need to think about is more that 30% opportunity. And as that 30% opportunity is achieved, that problem 25% will decrease. Last year alone, uh, the world lost 3.6 million hectares of primary rainforest. Uh, and this is data that was collected uh, by the World Resources Institute uh, Global Forest Watch. Size of the country of Belgium. So it's a very significant amount of natural primary rainforest, which holds extreme amounts of value in terms of carbon that's stored, as well as the biodiversity, as well as the people that live within these territories. What we do know is that commercial agriculture drives at least two thirds of tropical deforestation. And the companies that are behind these, are, there's thousands globally that we can identify, but we have the capacity to only research a certain amount of them. Uh, and what we think differs us from different organizations is that you know, we, we, don't, um, we don't look at uh, only one commodity or we don't also look at only one company and do any scoring. We're trying to have an encompassing look across four, these four main commodities um, which, which are really the four main drivers in the commercial agriculture space. We're talking about palm, soy, timber and pulp, and cattle. Uh, and what we are about to start uh, doing work with is, is on cocoa. But these have been the primary four since five years ago when we started the initiative. But I also want to talk about a little bit of our process uh, and what, what it is that we're actually doing. So when we're thinking about uh, you know, companies and, and we first need to have an understanding of, of what is that landscape of companies. And when we started this work in 2015 and produced a report in 2016, uh, we, we had about uh, a very limited understanding about how to prioritize our company research. And so what we at that point did was we, we tried to tackle uh, batches of companies that uh, are already reporting or providing transparent information into some major platforms like CDP, companies that are part of uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives like the, the Tropical Forest Alliance, as well as companies that are members of trade associations like the Consumer Goods Forum, 
And that became sort of the, the basis, the foundation of companies that we would, we would start researching. So the first step is to understand <clears throat> when we go through these lists of companies, does the company have exposure to the commodity? And then exposure really is, is sort of led from how much of that commodity is a part of their, uh, their annual revenues or how much of it is being used in the, in the services or end products that they provide. Uh, then we also wanted to take an understanding of from those companies that have exposure, then how many of those have an actual commitment to address commodity-driven deforestation? And I'll explain what that, what that means when we say a commitment, because there's a very basic look of this, which is, do they have a zero deforestation goal? But then there's many other attributes that companies can be working on uh, related to their policies that, that may be more specific to, they have a traceability system in place in order to address deforestation, but they may not have a zero deforestation goal. So they have policies and practices in place that are helping them to achieve that. So at this point, you know, early on, we had 366 companies with that information. Um, and I'll, we also were able to identify companies that don't have commitments. And so I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then when we look at those, those individual companies, we then try to identify the number of commitments they have to various policies or metrics or, or, or you know, as I just discussed. So that's why that number 579 is bigger than the 366 companies that have commitments. So we also then produce reports that go along with the research that we do. This was 2016, the present number uh, has exceeded um, our expectations. We're continuing to research and research more companies. Uh, and now we have uh, roughly 484 companies that have at least one commitment to palm, pulp and timber, cattle or soy. Um, and that represents 848 uh, individual commitments. So we just came out with this report, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the, the key thing that we developed five years ago, which we're in the process of, of really understanding how we can build upon it further, is our, our web platform. And I'll just quickly back out of this slide deck so I can show you, um, show you what it looks like, show you what it looks like and, and how to do some basic, uh, basic work on it. So at supply-change.org, everything that we have, uh, have compiled to date, uh, most of our information um, over the course of the years has been able to transfer onto us this website. And we do this in a few different ways. We have, um, we have commodity breakdowns. So if you wanted to take a look at Palm just in, in and of itself to see how many companies we have, there's 288 companies with, with palm oil being profiled. And then these are all the, the categories of products, you know, from Palm that um, that that companies are, are talking that, that have commitments for. So they have, they we're looking at palm oil, palm kernel, crude oil, um, palm, and then meal derivatives, other derivatives. And then to go further down, we have a breakdown by you know the sectors. And then what I also want to show is this is a, an overview of, the, of of not all but many of the the commitments and. Uh, and various policies that companies can be implementing. Um, so as I mentioned, zero deforestation is there, but things like FPIC, free and prior informed consent to does the company actually have goals around traceability and transparency? Are they, uh, and, and what we're finding though, if you look at these numbers in the boxes, this is the total number of commitment counts for each of these policies that very often for for companies, they're committing to sustainable and responsible sourcing, which is linked to certification. Uh, and, the, and the reason for that, that we can determine is because when you're establishing commitments, you need a clear pathway, not only to achieving that commitment, but to being able to report progress on that commitment. Okay. And with certification, you also have the ability to have certified volume numbers, and you have the ability to actually have a third party do that verification. Uh, so I'll go quickly into a company profile to give you a picture about what what that could look like, and um, and just because they have exposure across all four commodities, and they have commitments, pulling up Unilever. And there's a whole lot of information here, and I don't have enough time to go through all of the details, but. We capture information about the company on the high level, about their, their business, um, the business more broadly. But then, as I mentioned, we don't score companies and rank them, but instead we compile all the scores that they receive in third party uh, systems. So, so that's all available for um, perusal. And, 
And, and the reason why we thought this would be interesting to do is because companies may score really well in one, uh, one scoring framework and then score for, you know, not so well in another. Uh, and so that should, that should allow for questioning about what, what are those methodologies that go into uh, scoring organizations and they don't all score for the same things. But then you're able, but then you're able to quickly go between different commodities uh, within a, a single um, company profile view and to just kind of walk through for soy, for Unilever, 100% of soy will be sustainably sourced or verified or RTRS certified or offset by RTRS credits by 2020. So this is what they stated in their corporate documentation. We have the source information and we have a, a chart that maps out over a time timeline whether or not they have milestones, how they're going to get there. And then, as I mentioned, everything is free and, and uh, publicly available, so we list all the resources that we use, the top five resources to compile that information. So I'll go back now to the slide deck because I know, I know we have a limited amount of time. And, and then the, um, the question that we, we receive quite often is, <clears throat> you know, where do you focus your efforts in terms of companies? Uh, is it on the, the retailer or supplier side? Um, and we do our best to capture everything from upstream to downstream. So it's not a perfect proportion, but we, um, we, we've, we've been working hard to try to get more of producer and processor level uh, company information uh, through our desk research process. We also have a full uh, scope of, of company sectors, but as you can look at this chart, uh, I, I know it's not the perfect uh, viewing size, but the major bars in both companies with and without commitments are related to food products, food retail, and, and wholesale and consumer staples. Uh, so it goes to indicate you know, what these commodities are and what sectors might be most relevant for them. Uh, and again, I won't get into a lot of the details that are on this slide, but just to point out that we are both covering companies that are publicly held as well as companies that are private. Um, and that's important because while companies may be downstream in the retail and manufacturing or uh, side of the supply chain might be publicly held, you also have companies like Mars that are, that are privately held, and then you have companies upstream that are more likely not to be publicly held. Uh, so, so this is why it's important for us to, to keep it open for companies of all sizes as well as companies of all different uh, types. And our geographic breakdown has improved since this, uh, this infographic was developed. But one of the things that we're working on is developing uh, partnerships with uh, organizations that work in producer countries so that we can build out the number of companies that we're featuring but also be able to have a bigger, bigger representation of uh, producer level com companies. Um, and so we have a couple of initiatives that I'll talk about in just a little bit, like that deep, uh, deep dive into that. Uh, I wanted to just show this slide. There's a lot of information here, but the one point to pull out is while we have good representation of uh, our research across individual commodity types, uh, so palm, timber, pulp, soy, and cattle, the, the bars are relatively all equal. However, knowing the, the big bubble there above cattle, that's, that represents the, that cattle is the largest driver of commodity-driven deforestation. But through our research, we're finding the fewest number of company commitments for uh, the cattle sector. Um, and again, that goes back to some of the comments I made earlier around certification, uh, having for, for palm and timber and pulp, long-standing certification programs for those commodities and that a lot of the commitments are focused on sustainable and responsible sourcing and we don't have that global certification uh, opportunity for for the beef sector and for cattle um, so uh, I'll quickly talk about what's sort of core to uh, not just making commitments but companies reporting progress against those commitments so our, our work isn't done on just the first set of research that we do. We go back to these companies, some are on a six month uh, refresh cycle, others are on a longer re refresh cycle. But our team will continue to look at these companies over time and provide updated information about them. And we're finding that in, when we comparatively look year to year, companies that are a part of, that have, that have established commitments that are engaging with multi-stakeholder initiatives that are working on this issue year to year, 
that they're more likely to report progress than companies that are fresh out of the gate. Uh, and that is going to signify that there's a lot of work to be done in order to start being able to report any progress. Um, but when, when companies aren't reporting progress for a, s a number of years, so there's a few different criteria that's listed here where a company's target date has passed. So they've established a, a zero deforestation or a sustainable certification goal by year 2018. It's now 2019, there's no update from the company about that. That should be an alarm bell for a stakeholder. Why is there no public information providing you know, that progress? The second point around never had progress reported towards the goal, they might have established a goal in 2016, but we have not, and that the end date might be 2020, but we've not heard and seen any reports um, from that company in the meantime. Uh, and then they're all, what's, what's indicated there is milestones. And so milestones may be, um, you know, some, maybe they have a human rights goal, or they have a, uh, a transparency goal, they have something else that is a part of their overall deforestation goal that is in different years leading in, but they're not reporting progress against those milestones. And so the reason for that concern would be that if they're not providing information about their milestones, then how do we know that they're, they're gonna be able to report information about their overall commitment? And so when we looked at this in our 2017 annual report, and finding that 151 um, commitments from 135 companies were, were theoretically dormant in, in this categorization, that it, it does lead us to needing to have an understanding of how do we engage with these companies? Are they not providing that information because they don't have good news to share? Are they not providing that information because of the, 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 the challenging process in which it takes to just report this information, not even to mind calculate and quantify and gather the data? Um, so a common thing is survey fatigue and, and so the fatigue of being transparent about this. But the other finding that we had in our 2015 report, teen report our initial finding report, was that um, companies were more often to, or likely to report progress if they had good news to share. Uh, and that's, um, I think, an interesting, uh, interesting point. So I know, um, I don't have a whole lot more time, but I have just a few slides that I wanted to share and talk about where we're trying to go next with the work that we're doing. And um, the work to date has been a lot around capturing an understanding of who these companies are that are part of these commodity supply chains. That's step one. Understanding the exposure level is step, step two. And step three was understanding who had commitments. And so now we have a good enough understanding about this. We don't need to if we have five more companies next year that have a commitment, we don't need to do a big blast of a report that talks about those five new companies. But what we need to do is start zoning in on a few different um, criteria, but also being able to track uh, some of these initiatives that companies are participating in to help them achieve their goals. And so what you see here are these um, three kind of columns of, uh, of different organizations in which companies are either members of, or they work you know, very collaboratively with, on achieving their goals. And we, we tried to understand, in a sense, you know, are companies a part of these initiatives? Are they actually uh, setting commitments and are they, are they you know, doing well in those commitments and reporting progress? Um, and and you know, so, it's, so we can now do this across very you know, large number of multi-stakeholder initiatives uh, to understand if a company is a part of the Consumer Goods Forum, part of the New York Declaration on Forest, these are group level signups where they can, as a group of companies, say, we commit to zero deforestation by 2020, but then they individually will need to go a step further and set their own policies and their own commitments, and that's what we looked at. Um, and then others that are uh, featured here around, um, uh, I guess I would look at the Tropical Forest Trust or um, uh, that, that would be more of a membership based, they, they're sort of working collaboratively with this, this, this organization so that they can engage suppliers, they'd be able to improve uh, supplier capacity on, on dealing with um, these, uh, these commitments upstream. Um, and then this report came out uh, mid last year uh, where we zoned in specifically on traceability. 
And we did this in partnership with an organization based in Boston, Boston Massachusetts called uh, Ceres. They have an investor network who they work very closely with. Their investor network was interested in exploring uh, traceability because if a company has a commitment at the end goal to say, we will be deforestation free by 2030, 2025, the only way they can really get there is if they have a sense of who's in their supply chain and whether or not their supply chain actors are aligned with that goal. And this was the fee, this sort of, this is coming in from investors. So our, our approach in this way is that we're not just producing the reports that we want to produce, but we're reporting on information that our stakeholders are telling us they want. And what was really interesting about this is not, is not, just, not just that we found 50 or so you know, percent of companies that had a traceability aspiration, but what was more interesting was that companies are actually working on some of these criteria without actually having a goal for them. And so I just pulled out one of the key findings here because I don't have time to go into all of them. Um, but this shows that there were 41 companies that had an aspirational statement. They didn't have an actual commitment, but they talked about traceability. Um, and, a, and then they actually had progress that they were reporting on traceability and being able to have an identification of suppliers to the mill or to a certain geographic area. So this is, this is a really interesting um, you know, finding for a lot of reasons, and it's because where we are today versus where we were five years ago when supply chain started, where we were 10 years ago when the Consumer Goods Forum came out with its 2010 resolution, is that a commitment only has enough weight if companies are willing to pursue that commitment. Um, what is on the other side of this is companies that are willing to pursue actions to achieve a deforestation free economy, but because of the public scrutiny that they might be facing, they're not establishing a goal that actually puts them into the forefront or into the limelight of this. And so uh, this is feedback we're hearing from companies that increasingly they will be working on these issues, but they won't actually set a goal. And they won't set a goal that has a time bound nature to it because stakeholders will hold them to that goal. So we're starting to do some work to really understand what this could mean for the way we track companies and progress towards uh, commodity driven deforestation. Uh, so there's gonna be more to come on that. This is another uh, way in which we're building out our work and, and it's to be more specific about uh, a specific geography as well as commodity type. Uh, so we partnered with IFC to, um, to, to deep dive into Paraguay and the beef sector. And again, there's a lot of findings here that talk about the role in which not just internal national government policies and how they, how they can affect a company's decisions and how they produce or how they procure the commodity, but it's also in the countries in which the, that, pr that production is going to and what their policies are. Um, and so if com countries like Russia and other places that don't have the same stringency of uh, traceability and other types of stringency around zero deforestation in place, then there will always be a home for quote unquote bad supply of a commodity. Um, but so what I pointed out here, just in these examples, this is a table from the report, um, and this is going to be released very soon is that there's sort of different tiers in which companies can be specific about their commitments. They can be very general, they can have cattle specifically mentioned in their commitment, and then they can actually geographically reference uh, a jurisdiction or a landscape in which that, com that commodity is coming from. Um, so in the work that I know people here at the Green Climate Fund do around Red Plus investment into jurisdictions and landscape level, this is, this is really interesting uh, complementary data that can help support some of those investments if, they, if there's a lot of activity going into a certain geography. And then this is the last, um, last thing I wanted to share, which is a report that just came out uh, last week. Uh, we're gonna be doing a webinar to launch this report next week with, in collaboration with Ceres. Um, so, so as I mentioned, all these different goals, what, what we focused on here is zero deforestation, zero net deforestation explicitly. And, and as we did that, we also wanted to understand not just how many companies had a zero deforestation goal, but how they were reporting progress and, and very, very much looking at volume information, volumes of the commodities. 
So quantitative uh, ways in which companies can report against that zero deforestation goal. Uh, and, and so the findings from this, if you look at these numbers, we have 865 companies that are in our research you know, tracking system. 484 of those companies have some sort of goal for addressing at least one commodity in their, in their supply or in their production. But of those, only 72 had a zero or zero net deforestation commitment. And then even further down, only 21 of those companies uh, were reporting quantitative uh, volume progress against that goal. So it's a very low number of companies in the big picture of what we're tracking and what we have commitment information for. But this is just a, this is just a data point. We don't, we don't state exactly what this means. It doesn't, we're not saying that because companies don't have a zero deforestation goal, they're not working towards the issue. This is just taking what is the current framing of how the companies can address commodity driven deforestation is through these commodity categories, how many have them. So this is the state of that information. But as I mentioned before, we know companies are working towards achieving these goals without actually having a stated aspiration to do so. So that's the, that's the, 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 the full picture of everything that uh, the initiative is working on. It's, um, there's a lot more detail that I can go into and I'd be happy to answer any questions that people have. I think my, my question in this room would be, how could, how could an organization like the Green Climate Fund support companies to achieving zero deforestation goals? And you know, the work that we do on tracking these markets and how we could really understand the companies better, not just the companies that have commitments, but what about the companies that don't have commitments? And how can we pragmatically work with them to encourage them to be a part of the process rather than um, you know, potentially continue to source bad supply? So uh, thank you very much for listening. And I know that was a lot to go through in a very quick amount of time. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. Also, thanks for the pretty near round of applause. Uh, but let's now go for, uh, for the questions. And actually, Stephen already ask, ask, started asking a question to, to us. And uh, we have several people who are into the topic or around it. So welcome also to those who joined later. And thanks again to, for those from the uh, forest group, Juan, Veronica, and Mark. And uh, I now remember that also in our unit, uh, we have a so maybe a uh, forest expert since Andreas has been working at uh, C4 in the past, so I tried to see if he can come up with some, uh, something bright on, on the topic also, remembering his past, his recent past. Um, so let's um, um, maybe open the floor for, uh, for a number of questions, and also keep in mind uh, the, what he's been uh, proposing, what Stephen has been proposing as a preliminary uh, question from his side also. Um, Yes, of course. We start with Juan. He, he, you had two, of course. But um, let's, before that, let's see if other people have already. Uh, yes, so it's, um, oh, well, okay. It's overwhelming. So let's, uh, then it will be Veronica, um, uh, Cornelius, Anya, and uh, um, David. Okay, very quick. I think that there are more foresters here, perhaps not by background, but because by passion. passion I, right. I felt that here in GCF people are becoming more greener than ever. Uh, I have two questions. Actually, I wanted to ask the question that you asked. What is your advice for, uh, given that you have, uh, from your understanding, what GCF does and can do? What do you suggest, given this panorama that you gave us? By the way, thank you very much. And the second is that, is it possible to effectively uh, track or, or demonstrate that these commitments have reduced deforestation? Can we tell how much deforestation has been reduced because of this? Do you want to take several questions or just go one by one? Uh, well, anyway. But in any, in any case, those who in, uh, raise questions, please introduce yourself. Okay, I know you know each other already, but for the others, if you can also introduce. Maybe let's take three uh, groups of questions, and then next, Veronica, if you can introduce yourself also. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Veronica Galmes, I also work with, with Juan, with Mark, and now yeah, with the forest team here. Um, I was just wondering um, um, if you're thinking about developing the the demand change uh, platform. So just to try to understand what is also happening uh, from, the, from the demand side, uh, the, the consumers, um, of course the consumers are changing their, their consuming patterns. Um, there's a lot of study, studies going on on that. Um, there's a lot uh, that is also being supported by, by the whole circularity and the circular economy. Um, they're pushing, pushing very strong. So, 
so how, how do you envision the future uh, with all these changes in, in consumption patterns as well? I mean, uh, imagine having a, an app in your mobile phone with, that you can use when, when you go to the grocery and then you just scan the product and then you, you see not only the nutrition facts but also the deforestation facts of the product that you're buying. I mean, these this, this kind of changes in, in perceptions and consumption patterns, I believe it's also changing the way the corporation and the companies are seeing the, the whole problem. So I just wanted to, to hear about, about that. And before you answer, maybe one last, well, maybe Anya, if you can go with your uh, point, and, uh, and then we go for Cornelius and David and the others. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm in the same division with, with Juan and Mark and, and Veronica, but maybe more on the adaptation side. Um, I just, yeah, um, I was very struck by the fact that the sectors that were doing well that you showed, like soy, are the sectors where you've got very effective uh, kind of round tables operating, like the round table on sustainable soy, right? And the other sectors maybe don't have those kinds of um, private sector linking NGOs that are as effective. So I just wanted you to say a little bit about that. I mean, do you also look at helping NGOs to be more effective in, in certain sectors where you can see which ones are really working and which ones aren't. Um, so, I, I mean, I just see your work as being incredibly valuable for the organizations that are trying to do that kind of work, like IUCN, for example. Um, then I really wanted to ask you about a couple of sectors. You mentioned cocoa that you're going to start looking at, um, like what's been happening in Ghana, Ivory Coast. I mean, it's incredible how much deforestation cocoa has been um, causing, but again, they don't maybe have the most effective uh, organizations yet to, to bring the companies together to try to create commitments. Uh, perhaps if you could say a few words about that. And then also just to ask you about rice. Are you one day going to start looking to work on rice production? Because that, I understand, is starting to really cause a lot of deforestation as well. Thanks. Okay, so I think that was three questions at the end, which is fine. No, <laughs> and I, I knew I, I knew these wouldn't be easy questions. So um, if I if I forget anything that was being asked, just let me know. Um, but I think one you, you started by asking what would be my recommendation for the Green Climate Fund, and I, I mean I, I think there's a lot to explore in this. But when you we have a number of organizations that work to uh, convene, so the Tropical Forest Alliance. And the Consumer Goods Forum, which Consumer Goods Forum helped to, to build the Tropical Forest Alliance in, in collaboration with the U.S. government. And these, this is a multi-stakeholder initiative that is there to support uh, an industry association on achieving its sustainability goals. Um, then you have other organizations that, uh, like the Good Growth Partnership, uh, which you know has different UN agencies and um, nonprofit organizations like WWF that are part of collaboratively uh, you know, finding ways to support on the ground activities on on achieving you know more sustainable land use practice. Um, but in in a lot of the conversations that private sector is at the table at, um, what always seems to come up is you know we need a we need a stronger role from finance. We need a stronger role from not just necessarily banks or you know those types of institutions, but also those that are lending money to support uh, various production activities. And, and also to support on the ground, you know, actors and stakeholders like you just mentioned with COCO and, and what's happening in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, those, it's an entirely different supply chain where it's based on mostly smallholders that are feeding into uh, a big supply chain. Something like palm oil, which is large scale production in most cases from, from large, large companies on the production side, it's an entirely different methodology of how to attack, um, attack the issue. So, I mean, my, my understanding of how the Green Climate Fund is working towards Red Plus financing and support on the jurisdictional level, it would try to integrate these approaches so that you're also supporting on the ground production in a more sustainable way so that where the rest of all these companies are trying to, they're trying to find easier ways to identify good sourcing areas. 
and if we can identify, start to really support the establishment of not just jurisdictions, but landscapes, even within jurisdictions. And, and the Tropical Forest Alliance is working very, very much on that issue. So maybe I'll move on to the next, but we can definitely talk more about that. Um, the, uh, what was the second question that you had, one? Yeah, so this is, this is the, one of the, so when we, when we try to figure out what our role can be in tracking these commitments, all we can do is um, track some of the quantitative elements around hectares that companies report that are in production or in conservation as a result of their activities. We can also check around certification and compliance. Um, but we can't, we have, we, because we don't have a direct engagement with companies, we don't actually have a direct influence. So our, our influence, the way we've been trying to establish a clear connection is through partnerships like the one I mentioned with Ceres, who's actually engaging through their investor network with companies. And so we're providing data about companies that are in their portfolios, which they can then use and sit down with the company and say, we, we see here you don't have a, a zero deforestation goal. We're, we can see you're working on animal rights issues, but it's not tied to deforestation. You know, so, so that is our way of, of uh, supporting you know, other organizations that are more directly engaged in that. Um, so we have a challenge to provide those quantitative metrics, but we, we do that through collaboration. Um, and then the next question was, do you have the questions? Sorry? The demand side. Yeah, so, so we, because we look at the companies across the whole supply chain, we definitely recognize that the, the way in which influence works in these supply chains is, from, is coming from manufacturing and retail side to the brands. Um, and that's where the largest amount of public scrutiny is, and both from whether it's activist NGOs or it's from uh, financial institutions that are filing shareholder resolutions, but it's also you you'll hear and I, you know, wouldn't quote any of these companies directly, but you hear from brands that are saying it's not just those who are buying uh, that's changing the way that they're making decisions, but it's also their staff, their human resources. They're trying to attract the next generation of millennials, and that's helping to drive their more um, their commitments around commodity sustainability. Um, so there, that will definitely continue to influence, and the, but the question will be how does that influence transfer upstream, and where who's willing to take on the costs costs of certifying the production level, because that that always seems to come back as the issue of how do we actually finance change on the ground, establishing the commitments and moving that upstream is one thing, but does a company who gets a, a molecule of a commodity at the bottom of that supply chain, how much payment are they responsible for? And that's not been clearly established and clearly sorted out yet. Um, so we're definitely mo want monitoring that and trying to understand how we can track that as well. Um, and then it moved into uh, Coke. I don't know if I addressed the cocoa question, um, but we are, we're just getting going, so I, I can't really get into the, all the details. All I know is that um, there is the World Cocoa Foundation and the collaboration on uh, it's CFI, um, forgetting the, the acronym, but they've, they've established in the last year uh, a leading group of companies that now have a commitment around addressing deforestation in their commodity cocoa supply chain. Um, it's very early stages, so they're just, they've just established the principles of it and what they've committed to, and now the next year will be, uh, they have to start reporting on those commitments. Uh, and so that will be fodder for us and as we go through the, the process of researching these companies. So to date, all we've started to do is just ta do like a binary tally of do they have a commitment to address the deforestation in cocoa. Um, have I missed any questions? Um, no, I think you touched all of them. I don't know if the depth was uh, sufficient, but you may have a, a further discussion on that. Now, first, let's go to those two who had raised the hand before. Now, the first group was more thematic group. Now, it was uh, there was Cornelius. If you can introduce yourself, ask the question, and then um, Davide and uh, and. Uh, uh, <coughs> Hello, my name is Cornelius. I work at the Independent Evaluation Unit, and um, my question is more like more like 
management related? Do you have any um, knowledge about how the companies are pursuing their commitments? Is it uh, putting pressure on supply, developing suppliers, or is it rather supplier switching or even switching to alternative inputs? David? Yes, my question is about... Um, Can you introduce yourself also? Yes. Please. <laughs> so Davide from the risk division here at the fund. Um, the question is about um, the financial sector. Um, my background is in banking and in there I have seen that banks actually have the power to um, uh, control the supply chain. They um, deal with sellers and buyers and in particular they have entire divisions that look into trade and commodity finance. They establish the conditions of the goods through the letter of credits and through the... Um, uh, they enable basically trading worldwide. Sometimes these specifications can be very, very detailed uh, in all commodities and um, if the specifications are not met, the goods are not released in the ports. Um, there is a lot of uh, talk to include sustainability specifications into letter of credits and into other controls that the financial system is doing. I was wondering if you are looking into this and um, personally I think this could make a difference and um, it would help a lot. Yeah, thanks. And Tony, please. Uh, Tony from the private sector group here. So part of it is a development from David's uh, question. So I was going to ask uh, one: uh, Who are the worst offenders? Who are the top three? Just uh, who are they? Um, and uh, what what can we do about those? Uh, whether it's name and shame, or is it you know local legislation or international legislation? So it's a relatively simple question. But beyond that, on the finance side, obviously people like the IFC have introduced the equator principles around project finance, and uh, that's applied you know, across the banking sector, but this is a different thing. It's not about doing no harm at the cost level. It's about, you know, the supply chain and the revenue and sourcing and so on. So what's the best angle there to, to uh, is, it, is it through the investor base, pension funds? Is it, you know, uh, uh, threatening to downgrade uh, or exclude uh, companies from portfolios? Just interested in your view. While Stephen thinks about the answers, I give you 30 seconds. I just want to see, uh, have a sense of who else is interested in raising points. So if you could raise your hands now. Okay, anybody else? Cheesy. And last chance. So we will have about 10, 11 minutes. Okay, so two more people after this round. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so the first question was about um, how, do, how, how are we tracking the way in which companies are implementing their commitments? And I, I wanted to pull up the screen that I had before because <clears throat> the way which we try to take you know, stock of this is, you know, as I mentioned before, around understanding what a, an end goal is and what an overall um, you know, commitment is around, you know, let's say, zero deforestation or uh, even sustainable responsible sourcing. In, in the company documentation, they will talk about all, many of these other elements that are, are kind of required part, parts of the process for them to get to that goal. So do they, have, do they have to establish high conservation value areas in order to know what they can source from and where they cannot source from? Um, how are they uh, working around human rights or re reducing just the amount of commodity in which they're using in the first place? So these may seem like individual metrics or elements, but they're the way in which they're they're embedded within a company's commitments and goals. It's it's as a pathway towards you know getting to the the end result of driving down deforestation. So it's the awareness level of of what's in their supply, the awareness level of where they can uh, source from, as well as uh, what they're doing to to engage with small holders. Um, that and how they're actually implementing uh, various other practices like you know reducing the consumption or protecting biodiversity and wildlife um, so, so that's one way and then going back to just going back to a company profile um, <clears throat> there's there's different ways in which we've tried to tackle this here as well so in 
uh, and uh, this is you know, just uh, not for any purpose calling out 3M, but just to take uh, some of this high level information here, we, what we call related activities uh, uh, are the various initiatives that I mentioned before, like the, the Forest Trust or the Consumer Goods Forum, are they reporting uh, information through various recognized uh, platforms like the Global Reporting Initiative, CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project? Are they working in any multi-stakeholder groups like the World Business Council on Sustainable Development? So these are uh, what we think of as companies' commitments or actions towards achieving their commitment. Uh, and then we also, in their uh, company profiles, when we looked at those, um, those elements on the commodity page, we, we show them on a company-by-company uh, company level what's been included. What we do not show here is what's been excluded but probably should be included in a company's commitments and policies criteria. And that's because, to, and then this is somewhat to address the, the question at the end around you know, who are the worst offenders, what we established very early on for our platform is that we wouldn't be a naming and shaming system. There's plenty of them out there companies receive criti criticism all the time uh, and what we actually felt might be more advantageous for us was to establish an entirely flat neutral platform that is purely pulling in what companies are already reporting but for some companies it might be 20 to 30 different data sources and so what hopefully this is doing by increasing the transparency has been done but by increasing the visibility into that transparent information that hopefully this is enabling stakeholders and the companies themselves to hold them to then to account for their commitments. So we've never really talked about who are the worst offenders. Instead, what we've done is talk about the companies that are achieving their goals. And in that slide I had up where it, it sort of balanced the general commitment to the commodity specific commitment to then identifying what is sort of leading practice on being granular and geographically specific. Um, that's how we've tried to uh, understand you know, who are the leading companies or who's really kind of pushing things to the next level. And, and this is, I think, going back to a point I made earlier, something that has come up you know, very often with us. And the reason why uh, we're, we're kind of an easy organization to collaborate with is because we're not taking a position on any of these certain things. We're not saying that um, one of the commitment criteria should be more important than the other. And so that allows us to be the, the, the data source or the kind of the data platform, which then the stakeholders can make their own kind of use from. Um, so then other ways in which we've uh, just kind of talk about one last thing and then I'll move on to the, the role of the banks and the finance sector. Um, but the way we've also tried to look at uh, a company's you know, actions is through the various tools and technologies that they've, they talk about implementing. So whether it's around um, geospatial systems that will, will give them a different data la layer for them to see from afar where their sourcing zones are and what's, what kind of activity is happening over time. They get alerts about uh, deforestation and that sends a signal in that they, they might want to engage with that that sort of that supply. Um, other ways that we track this is our you know, companies that are developing their own tools or releasing information that never was available before around their, their mills. Uh, mill lists have started to come uh, into, the, into the transparency fold, which never would, have ex never would have happened five years ago. So this sort of push for greater transparency is definitely going to increase over time and we're, we're trying to track these little minute elements that may seem insignificant in actually achieving zero deforestation, but they're showing a progression of companies on that pathway. And then we, um, and then on the finance side, we don't track, uh, in the initial days, we thought we would track uh, financial institutions. Um, other organizations do this, and there's the, the Banking Environment Initiative, uh, there's UN Principles for Responsible Investment, uh, CDP, Series, a number of other organizations that have quite effective programs in this. Um, what, what we probably would do in this is try to pair up our information, our data layers around what we're seeing companies and where they're, if, whenever they are actually speaking geographically about a commitment or a policy, that could be really good information to pair up with 
a financial institution, with a bank, and show them this is what we know about this country, this sub subnational level. Um, but but we haven't haven't had those conversations yet. But we'd be interested in exploring that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And um, uh, given that we have five minutes left, uh, of course, after you can, uh, you're very welcome to engage with Stephen. Um, we had two more people who had raised their hands, and I think we, uh, we stopped there because between questions and answers, that would be enough in terms of time. So please, if you can uh, introduce yourself. Um, I'm Jeanette Gurung. I'm the director of an international organization called Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management. I'm an outsider. I'm a guest. I was invited here this week to talk about gender mainstreaming in, in our experience. So thank you for the offer to be here. Um, Stephen, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, when when you're when you have you're accepting data that's both from certified quantitative data as well as uncertified, and putting it all on as you call a flat platform, or is there not a danger that you're amplifying um, and covering up something? I mean, as a consumer, if something's not been certified by independent auditors, I'm leery of um, the claims of companies, the greenwashing aspect. Thanks, and uh, thanks a lot. Uh, outsiders are very much welcome, of course. <laughs> and Cheesy, for your last point. Yeah, that's related to the very last thing that you said, that is there any effort to kind of harmonize these various reporting and these tracking initiatives? Yeah. Sharp. Anybody else? I, you have you already employed Andrea? Please. Okay, sorry. Um, um, I, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, um, Tony for, the, for his question because that was exactly the question I wanted to pose, <laughs> to ask to really see what offenders are talking about. I have, however, a second question. I was recently invited to uh, talk about transboundary risks, climate risks. So um, with, uh, with uh, the uh, Global Adaptation Center in Europe as well as SEI and, and uh, UNFCCC. And what was interesting from that conversation was that they actually looked at this question actively to look at supply chains and how supply chains can help to inform transboundary climate risks. And the question here is for me, um, I, I noticed that, you, that you're doing a great job on, on trying to provide information. Well, there's obviously concerns about what sort of data points you're using, but uh, trying to provide that information um, on, on the commitments. But the commitments, I'm just worried that they, they don't say enough. So th I was really wondering how could that be translated into risks to really show, and this is what the UNFCCC said, it said, Often we have uh, trade relationships between two developing countries, and now one developing country I is finding it hard due to droughts or other uh, other things to to supply effectively what what is promised in trade deals to another country, and that other country will then have severe risks at hand that are all due to climate. So I was just wondering if you if you could refer to this and, and, and see any chance, or if you're already looking at that, that would be interesting. Thanks. That'll be it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Quick. Okay. Good. Um, so, so the first one around the the data and the you know so, so it's a very fair question and in fact it's a lot of the reason why we didn't establish a a, a scoring or a qualification system you know in addition to creating this platform um, we we know full well that you might have a bilateral conversation with a company and get a lot more information or different information than what they're reporting publicly. Um, but when we are saying we depend on what the companies are reporting in a public domain, what, what I think is actually, you know, to, to kind of think about the, the value that this is playing first is it's making it easier to get to that data. So that's sort of step one, which now we've, we've kind of done that, but there's a lot more companies that we need to do that for. But our role, we're not that kind of organization that would do the evaluation. So, but if we can make it easier for others to get to this information, which we hear from, whether it's nonprofits, to academia, to consultants, companies, finance, we hear from all the different stakeholder groups that they use our website and they use our reports and they use the data. That's, that's the opportunity. I think in, in enabling others to more effectively be able to do their work in a faster way. When we started supply change, 
every single organization we talked to said they were doing the exact same piece of work and the amount of time redundancy in that was enormous. So we actually never initially had the idea to do a web platform, but we did that because we wanted to make it easier for others to access the information. Um, so I'm not, I'm not passing on that question, but I think we made a very determined role in the beginning to not, not, do a, um, not make any judgment on the source of the data, only to say that it has to be company reported. And so maybe I'll, we can leave it there and I can chat more about that with you. Um, and then the second question was around efforts to harmonize tracking initiatives. This is, there's been a, I've been a part of a countless, probably dozens, if not three to four dozen meetings about how various initiatives can harmonize. And this is not just the ones that are obvious, like supply change to something like Forest 500, which goes a step further and does that scoring. Um, or